Uh, my name's Phil. I'm from Fremont, and um, I've been um, doing some. Uh, everybody finds their niche in, in beekeeping, and um, you know, find something that you're good at. And I chased swarms for a little while, and then I started doing some swarm traps because it's the same kit, right? You set up your kit for swarm chasing swarms and have it ready at the back gate and a swarm moves in. So um, after I did this a couple of times, I realized I didn't have to go chase swarms much anymore. I can just set up the whole rig and and, and go to work, right? Um, let's see what happened here. There we go. All right. So we're going to talk tonight about swarm traps. Uh, some people call them bait hives, bait boxes, um, so, you know, whatever. There's lots of different ways of, of thinking about it and talking about it. Um, but the whole idea is that in the spring, bees swarm. And you're trying to catch those swarms. So that's what we're trying to do, right? And it's basically just fishing. Um, so, you know, all the same rules of fish and applying, including sometimes just grabbing a beer and, you know, sometimes the best you can do is catch a buzz out of the day. Um, and hopefully you catch this kind of a buzz out of the day, right? So here's a shot of, of me um, getting a stack of boxes ready. Each one of those was a box that was going out. Um, they were all going to be swarm traps that I was setting out and a couple of supers that I was going to put in some boxes that are not at my house. And, um, we're just setting up, getting ready to go. You know, truck is out there on the curb on the other side of that lock gate. And um, you hear the noise. And, <laughs> and I said, well, I guess we're not, uh, we're not moving that stack of boxes today. Um, so, so you can do everything you want, right? And you may be unlucky. You may do everything wrong and end up a winner. Um, so everything that I say can be taken with a grain of salt. And you can call me a liar at any point. And you may be correct. Um, you know, bees have moved into water irrigation boxes in the ground. I don't know how many times we get that call every year. Um, you know, it's like the worst thing. Everything you read about where to put a swarm trap is not in the ground under a plastic lid, but they move in there none the same. So take this all with a grain of salt. All this is trying to do is to improve your odds. Right, so they will move in where they will move in, but if you have a better choice for them, then that's where they'll move in, All right? But long and short is you can't win if you don't play. It's just like lottery, right? Um, so I blame it all on Tom, Tom Seeley. Um, I picked up his book, Honey Bee Democracy, by somebody's recommendation in the, in the club. And um, I read that thing covered it back and then went and reread it again just to make sure I understood all everything and he was talking about it I just couldn't believe it and then of course I you know hindsight's 2020 the uh, the intro is written by none other than E.O. Wilson who just passed away and uh, if you haven't done some E.O. Wilson uh, YouTubes lately um, I recommend it uh, just go to YouTube and, and type in E.O. Wilson and listen to some of his stuff and five hours later, you'll be like, holy cow. Um, anyway, um, so the life of bees is great from Tom Seeley um, and following the wild bees and that, that swarm chasing. You can, a um, lot of good stuff in there. But in Honey Bee Democracy, he talks about the democratic choice of voting for where, a, where a swarm goes and what a swarm does. And that gave me a lot of the inference on where to, put things and what to do with them. So why would you even do swarm traps? Well, first of all, it's free bees. Um, so, right, you do life and the bees do whatever they want to and you come home to a new swarm. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great fun thing, right? It's also your social responsibility, right? So if you're catching swarms in your yard, that means that swarm is not moving into someone's shed or into somebody's attic or into the grill of your neighbor's car or wherever else they may be, you know, latching onto for a little while. So if you catch them, then at least you have a chance of giving them a good safe home. 75% um, of swarms do not make it in the wild. So if you catch a swarm and you put it in a box and you give it all those things, you got a very good chance of it surviving. So 
Um, you're also catching survivor stock. So if it's strong enough to make it to the spring and launch, it's got something going for it. I can't say it's the perfect genetics, but I can say that it's probably pretty good genetics that uh, you've got in there. And even if you don't need all of those colonies that you catch, I mean, I catch anywhere from 10 to 25 every year. And they'll say, I don't have that many colonies. You give them away, you make friends, right? I get a lot of free honey out of the deal, right? Um, but your swarm trap is the same kit as you have for swarm chasing. So if you're on the swarm list and you're gonna do swarm chasing, you always should have a kit ready. You should have a box ready at the, at the gate, right? And so it's the same kit that you want in there, right? So it's usually the first week of March, weather dependent, of course, on when they show up. Um, the latest I've caught a swarm was in October. Um, so I leave my, most of my swarm traps are up most of the year. Some of them I never take down. I just go back and refresh them and, and you know, fit them up. So I started this in 2015 and I've been doing pretty good and uh, my numbers have been increasing. Last year was pretty bad. Um, I only caught 12, um, but it was still a pretty good year. Um, there, just, there just wasn't much swarming, but in my area. So I don't know what's in my area. There's somebody or something, there's a shed or a couple of sheds that have bees in it. Maybe they all got killed because somebody found them. I, I don't know, but. 2020, um, it was a crazy year. We just caught a lot of them, right? And so Jerry's gonna be talking a little bit about the uh, Alameda County Beekeepers Association swarm list. That's gonna happen next uh, month. Um, great thing to be under. It's if, if you pay your dues and just sign up, it's a, it's a great circus just to watch in your emails if you're working and you're just following people's lives as they're chasing swarms all over the countryside. It's great fun. But we're getting been getting more and more swarms every year. Our number is getting broadcast more for, with police stations and fire departments and public service and also other clubs. I know our number is on the San Francisco Beekeepers Association. So um, I don't know if we're just getting more calls or what. So what's the timing of this whole thing? Um, we, somebody was asking that just earlier. Right, um, it's a lot has to do with the drones, obviously. Um, so this is the, uh, the the calendar, the the you know the compass rose. Um, our seasons definitely follow the the old calendar, as in you know a couple thousand years ago when they talked about the first day of spring being February two, and that is very much true, right? Um, common um, vernacular says that our seasons begin on the solstice and the equinox, but our seasons actually start about six weeks before that on the eighths of the year, not the quarters of the year. So the first day of spring is generally February too. And there's a lot of other celebrations. Um, the Jewish celebration of Tub Shavat, it's the birthday of the trees. Um, it's also uh -huh. in the uh, Northeast when you, uh, I mean, Northwest, Northeast, when you start uh, tapping the maple trees for syrup. Um, so there's a lot of things happening. And for some reason, the bees, even in the cold climates, start building up around February 2nd. So the, you know, the light is starting to change a little bit, but I don't know how they can tell, sense that inside of a dark hive covered with snow, but they do. Um, so that's when they start building up. And that's definitely gonna be true around here. So um, that, that, that's kind of what happened. So the first day of spring is, is February 2, and that's when a lot of things happen. And they start putting on more drones. So as we look in our hives in the next couple of weeks, you, you can probably start seeing that, especially if we get this nice warm sp spell in the next 10 days. That's really going to push it up a little bit, right? But if you take a look at you know, a drone, if they start putting in drones, Right, it takes 24 days for them to, to hatch. Then a couple more, you know, another 10 days or so for them to stretch their legs and start getting exercise and start flying out and so forth. And so then if, if they start making queen cells, that starts happening. You put all of that stuff together and that's about four to six weeks. 
right, all, all together. So if they're starting around February 2, six weeks, lo and behold, comes to be the equinox, March 21. So the beginning of March seems to be when we start seeing our first ones and it starts ramping up from there. Um, so that's definitely been pretty much true. This is a, a book from a, a calendar from, there you go, from, from Butler wrote this in 1634. Um, that spring was February, March, and April. And our summer was May, June, and July. Um, and August, uh, so that's, that's, that's pretty much true the way our season goes here in the, in the Bay Area. So that's, that, that worked pretty good. So this is our swarm list. We'll look at some of the graphs for the subsequent years, but this is from 2017. Thank you very much, Jerry, for putting this together from the swarm list. Um, you know, just, just simple. This is very simple by, by month. And uh, we take a look at it and we put the equinox and solstice right on top of that thing. And lo and behold, between the first equinox, which is March 21, and the solstice in June 21, that's when we're going to get 60% of our swarms and then it tapers off from there. And what we kind of see in this pattern and in all the subsequent patterns, this is, is kind of, um, as they say in statistics, bimodal. Um, we get a big first swarm and then we get another group coming in after that. And so thanks once again to Jerry for all this fantastic data. Um, we'll put this on the website so you can look at this thing a little bit more intensely. The blue was last year and that was from 2021. So we had a, a pretty banner year last year. These are the swarm calls. So take that all with a grain of salt. Maybe we're just getting more popular. People know us more, people are more aware, um, whatever it is, right? That, that, that doesn't mean that there are more swarms particularly, but it does show that we've got a big peak and look at all these years stacked on top of each other that come the equinox, they're just ready to launch. So the sooner you get your boxes out, the sooner the, is better, right? But it also shows that we've got kind of a second wave right before the solstice, before it starts tapering off. And so we've got a little bit of, you know, kind of waviness going on here. It comes in pulses. And um, I haven't quite speculated what that is yet. Um, this is one of those things we need to talk to Tom Seeley or some of the others about, um, about what, what we're seeing here as far as maybe Wally Shaw's got some input as to what that first wave, second wave, third wave, maybe we can copy COVID. Oh, we don't want to do that. Um, this is from the San Mateo Bee Club. They get all of their data is logged in. Um, you go into the website and so, and report a swarm. And so with that, it's recording all of this data on their website. I mean, um, yeah, on their website. So they have some really hard data that's pretty easy to, to pull off. So obviously the, the time of day doesn't tell us much because we know kind of when they're gonna swarm is during the day, but I don't know many people, there's not many swarms at two o'clock in the morning. There's people calling though, or reporting at two o'clock in the morning. But lo and behold, his pattern on, you know, for the San Mateo Club is very much the same. 60% is between the equinox and the solstice and the summer solstice. So I, um, his data also shows that bees prefer to swarm on Monday. So I don't think that's true, but um, I think that's when they get reported. Maybe people get fascinated over the weekend and finally report them, but um, I don't know that bees prefer Mondays. So how do they find these things? Well, they're the scouts, they're the oldest bees. And the old bees, um, you know, you may think of them as old bees, think of them as eight year old boys running around and they're gonna, you know, you know, explorers. They're just finding any little nook and cranny and getting into any trouble that they can. And as soon as the weather starts getting warmer and the colony starts building up, you'll start noticing them just checking out all kinds of weird stuff. And you're like, what are they doing over there? Right, they're looking at anything and everything. I've got a bunch of plants in the backyard and they're over looking in the pots and drinking out of the dishes and they haven't been there all year. Come springtime, they start showing up. They're all over the place, right? So they're always scouting. 
and they start remembering things. And so they may not have a need to swarm on a place to go, but when they do, they know where to go, right? So they're always scouting. They're, they're really scout in earnest when they're ready to swarm. So here you see a group of bees just coming in and out. They're talking to each other. They're having a little conversation on the doorstep. They're sometimes being somewhat friendly. Sometimes they're getting a little bit of a tussle because there's another swarm showing up in there, but they'll be coming and going and coming and going. So that's a great site. If you have you know, four or five bees hanging out, checking it out, life is good, right? So they're mostly attracted to that dark hole and a lot of the scent inside of there. So the scent is that big flashing neon light that brings them in. It's like you're driving down the freeway and you smell fried chicken and you're like, you know, maybe it's about time to pull over. Um, so they're going to go inside. They're going to, they're going to, they go inside and they fly around a little bit or at least flap their wings to get a little bit of buzz and they're listening to the echo. So they want to hear that they've got an adequate sized box in size of it. So if they can hear the echo and, and so forth, and you know, you can do the same thing, you know, you walk into a room and you talk and you can tell if it's a really big room or not. So they do the same thing. They're looking for a defendable entrance, something that they can protect. So less than two square inches. This entrance is a little big, but eh, it works still none the same. They inspect the outside of the box. They walk around the outside. Um, they spend a little bit of time on the porch, hanging out, talking with the others. Um, so they'll check out the inside, they'll check out the outside. Um, but it's that scent that brings them in. They may be flying somewhere nearby and they're like, ooh, I smell something. So that's going to bring them in in the first place. Uh, something to notice on this one, this is a uh, screened bottom board. And so that's a piece of coroplast shoved in there to uh, close off that because we want a nice and still quiet box in there. Solid bottom boards are usually better, but if all you got is some screen ones, just close them up with some coroplast or cardboard or something. That helps out. So this it's, it's kind of a tsunami thing. And, and George and I have had some great conversations about this, uh, you know, and it, it's, it happens so many times. You know, you got bees showing up and sometimes you have scouts hitting your hive and they're just day after day after day. And you're just like, come on. I know you girls know about this place. Why are you not moving in? Well, they're going to move in when they're going to move in, right? So you'll see them, you know, five at a time, and then it's going to be 20. So then when you start seeing, you know, maybe 50 or more of them showing up and a lot of them coming in. So this is from Honeybee Democracy that Seeley describes. One bee finds it. They go back and they tell the rest of the hive, this is a great place. And so if she's really emphatic about her dance, then all of the other bees that listen to her are gonna come back. And so every bee only gets to vote once. And so then more and more show up. And so by the time that they, you know, if the swarm has already swarmed and is sitting in a tree somewhere in a cluster, right? They're all going back and they're getting everybody excited. Then the whole swarm gets all excited and to watch them lift off is fantastic. And then they all take off and all of those bees who visited the hive are gonna be directing that swarm into the new hive, right? And so you end up with, you know, when they make that decision, they all have to go back. And so all of a sudden there's no bees. So if you see the, the colony, you know, the action at your entrance going up and up and up, and then all of a sudden there's nothing, that's the time you go inside and you pour yourself a big tall one, get out your lawn chair, Make sure your battery is charged on your phone or other recording device and uh, check it out. So it's often between 10 and four, all right? It's usually, they, they, they need to warm up in the morning if it's cold and after four or five o'clock that they usually don't swarm. They usually just call it quits for the day and do it next day, right? Um, oops, um, let's go that way. And so when they come in, it's just a fantastic thing. So oftentimes you hear them before you see them. So um, Greg Mao and I were loading up the truck one day in the backyard, getting ready to do something. And uh, we were putting boxes in the truck and back and forth and chit chatting about this, that, and the other. And all of a sudden we're like, we stopped and both looked at each other. And I said, do you hear that? I hear that. 
And it's like, <laughs> okay, where are they going? Cause I got swarm traps in every corner of the yard. And he can't tell when they come in, but the yard is all of a sudden just filled with thousands of bees. The, the roar is fantastic. So, and then we just walk around and say, okay, which box are they gonna hit? Where are they going? They picked one of them. So this was, this was the one that they picked that day, right? That the air is just full of them and the sound is fantastic. And when they move in, it, it takes about an hour or two, but sometimes you just don't think that they're gonna fit. They all land on the outside and somewhere in there usually is the queen. So if you're very adventuresome, you can kind of fiddle through there and try and find her. She's going to be in a little cluster. They're going to be, you know, covering around her. So she doesn't always find the entrance. She may just land on the, on the outside of that and they all land together and they'll all just be hanging out. And then as soon as the queen goes in, they all go in or sometimes not. I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. But it takes them a little while to, for them to all filter and it's it's great fun to watch it's, um we this was one that happened on my lunch hour fortunately um but here's a great swarm this is a, a swarm trap called a swarm commander it's basically the size of a nuke stacked on top of each other it's corrugated plastic they're about 50 bucks they work pretty good so it holds 10 deep frames stacked on top of each other um, so this was in Fremont. Uh, one of the Fremont beekeepers caught this one a couple of years ago. It works. It's a, it's a pretty good swarm trap. If you're going to buy stuff for swarm traps, that's one that's worthwhile. So that one was showing up last year and I called Greg who happens to work close by. So he came over in his lunch hour and they're really docile. So a swarm comes, everybody in the neighborhood is going to be freaking out, running away. And you can play like the New York fire department and just walk in in the middle of the swarm and act like God and people will be shocked and amazed um, at, you know, at, at your antics. But yeah, you can get very close and, and a lot of people have showed um, how you can just reach into that swarm barehanded and try and find the queen, right? So these are the three essentials that you need to do. There's lots of different ways to build a swarm trap, lots of different things to do. But if you cover these three things, you'll have better luck. And that's all this is, is luck, right? I can't say that you're gonna get a swarm over here, but these are the things that I cover. I've used all manner of different shapes of things to put bees in. We used a, um, somebody gave me a fish box, you know, that fish got shipped in a styrofoam box that I put some, Put a bunch of medium frames in it. Um, see, we use some uh, some old wine boxes um, that Sung got at the uh, at the liquor store with a sliding door on it. Um, you know, I, I used all kinds of funky things to catch swarms, and people catch them. And of course, in those silly flower pot things, which I can't recommend um, for many reasons. But these are the three things you need to have that right scent in there need to give them some accommodation and it has to be in the right location. So those are the, the three fundamental things. And after that, go wild. You can find all kinds of things to, to try and do that. If and the scent. If you can you also mention that, make sure you put the box in a place where you can pick it up. <laughs> Not like I did, I did one of them and I nearly killed myself coming. I put it too high and I couldn't bring it down. Yeah. Uh, Make sure you can move it afterwards to a nice location. That is that is most certainly true. So the, the, the scent, if you ever played in perfumes, you talk about scents in high notes, medium notes, and low notes, just like you do on music. Um, and so there's a wide range of scents that the bees are familiar with, and they've got a fantastic sense of smell. That's about 100 times better than a dog. So... And you, you know what a dog finds, uh, you know, so they find all kinds of things and they smell with their antenna in there. So that high note is the stuff that you can pick up very well also is, uh, you know, mimics the Nazanoff gland. Um, and that's lemongrass oil is, is very common. So if you're, that, that's the bare minimum is some lemongrass oil. Um, Swarm Commander has a whole bunch of stuff in it and there's a whole, it's a brand and there's a whole bunch of different swarm lures that you can buy. Man Lake has them and 
Blue Sky B has them and Daydant has them. Uh, everybody has a swarm lure for sale. Swarm Commander has kind of been the, the, the standard. They make a bunch of different ones. It works pretty well. Um, a fresh bottle of it costs you 20 bucks or is it 25 bucks? I don't know what it is this year. I haven't looked at it. Um, but if it catches you, you know, a couple of swarms, you're good, right? You're quite well ahead. Uh, queen pheromone is another one in there. So um, putting some queen pheromone inside of the box um, helps a lot. So if you raise a lot of queens or if you're pinching off queens, um, put them in a little glass jar with some alcohol. And so now you'll have queen pheromone in there. So a little, a little pinch between the, the you know, cheek and gum, as it were, um, will bring in a lot um, in there. The smell of propolis is really good. Wax, um, black comb and old wood, right? It's not, those are, you know, those low notes are not something that we're terribly, our noses aren't terribly sensitive to, but those are those things that are comforting, hold home, you know, right? That's, that, that's what a bee is, is looking for. Right. If they're on the wing, they're going to smell that lemongrass, that swarm commander. That's what's going to be the, the flashing neon light that's going to pull them in. But once they get into the box, that's going to be the comforting things that is going to make it a lot more comfortable for them to, to accommodate, uh, to uh, move in, um, in there. So the swarm commander comes in the spray. That's when I use the one in the middle. I've used that one predominantly. Um, I use that little jelly thing on the side. I don't know, it's a crazy bee carrying a bottle of whiskey. I don't understand it, uh, but uh, he seems to work okay. Um, up on top, you see in some of the plastic bags, some of those little vials. And so that's what you can get from, you know, Swarm Commander makes some, but you also get some from all of the other bee makers. Um, Swarm Commander came also in a gel. Um, I can't tell you that it's, it was new five years ago. Um, I can't tell you that it's any better than, than, this, than the mist or whatever. Um, but lemongrass oil is kind of that, that, that most closely mimics the Nazanoff gland and will bring them in. So that little bottle is usually four or five bucks at like Whole Foods or Sprouts or one of those other ones, or you can get it online at Amazon, I'm sure for the same price. And that last one there is anise oil. And that's one I picked up from Tom Seeley. Um, you want to just see what is in your neighborhood, just put some anise oil out on a nice sunny day and you'll see how many bees are in there because it's a very strong flower scent and the bees will show up pretty quickly. It's, uh, it's amazing how well it, it works. Um, I would not recommend it as a perfume unless you like having a lot of bees on you, right? Um, so I spray inside of the hive, inside of the cover, um, I use a lot of slum gum mats, which is just basically some fabric. I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but we're, I'm, I'm really happy with slum gum mats. They, they, they work really well and they carry a lot of scent um, because they have a lot of wax and, and everything else from the hive inside of it. Um, and, if, yeah, and you spray that. What you got there, Elfie? You got your... I, I have this, um, there's the Swamp Commander, I don't know if you can, and this is lemongrass, but I think the best one so far, Phil, it was this lady, honeybee, uh, from, from Berkeley, um, and she stopped making it, uh, she's too busy or whatever, uh, and I think that this one was the best, but She's not supplying it anymore. I just kept it because her phone number is here. Yeah, that, that, that's Alice Rosenthal. Uh, yeah. we, we see if we can get Alice to um, get back. If, in she the can make, if she can get back on it and make some more, we'll give her the money. It's not a problem. But um, I found this the best. Yep. Swamp Commander. Uh, it just, and don't, not too much, just uh, a little yep. bit. Just a little and bit. I, I normally put it on a, on a piece of paper towel and then put it in a plastic bag and then fork a few holes on it and put it in a corner inside so I can take it out afterwards. Yep. Uh, that's the best. Phil, this is what we've been doing. It's, and it works rather well. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so, so you always think of a plastic bag as being a good seal, but plastic bags are not a good seal. 
Um, it's, it's called a, in packaging, there's a vapor transmission rate, VTR, and a thin plastic bag has got a very high vapor transmission rate, surprisingly. Yeah. So you put some of that strong scent inside of a plastic bag and it will soak right through, but the plastic bag will keep that fresh for a little bit longer. Yes. So if you set up a swarm trap and you don't get back to it for a while, put it in a little plastic bag in the corner and that will do fine. Or sometimes, you know, like LP says, just put a, you know, poke a few holes in it um, and that will keep it going. Uh, normally it's good enough for about two and a half, three weeks. Um, that's what I found. Yep. So some of the other good, good scents in there is uh, some black comb. There's nothing like the smell of black comb. You know, um, it, you get your nose right on top of it. Um, if you have some of the stuff that's a little bit moldy, a little bit not so good, um, I just get out the hose with a, with a sprayer tip on it and spray it all out and then throw it in a, um, I got an old two frame spinner. Thank you very much, Jeannie. That thing is still working. Um, and it spins the water right back out. It refreshes that uh, pretty well. Um, but the yellow wax also carries a lot of scent in there. Propolis has an undeniable scent and bees are always foraging for propolis. You put an old box out and the bees will be out there on a warm day just picking all the propolis off. All right, there isn't anything else in there, but they'll be picking the propolis. They don't care about the old pollen. They'll, they'll of course steal the honey, but after the honey, it'll be the propolis they'll take out of there. And they're also looking for old wood. So new wood is just, it's, it's got, it's too piney, right? It's just got too much scent to it. Um, so you know, if you, if all you've got is fresh new wood, then you'll probably want to season it with something. Um, we had one beekeeper in Fremont here who built all of these brand new swarm traps. Um, and uh, he was he, he's like, I'm going to catch something. And we're like, it's all fresh wood. It's, you know, it's plywood and stuff. And so I said, here, here's my jar of propolis, which I scavenged. He threw that in a blender. I don't know whatever happened to that blender. Um, with a bunch of alcohol and he sprayed all of those things in there and he cut three swarms in the side of three weeks. It was fantastic. So propolis wash on the inside is a really good deterrent. I mean, uh, attractant. It works really, really good. Um, and the other one is the last one that I'm, I really like. Um, George and I have spent a lot of time talking about slum gum Matt and uh, his uh, wife, slum gum Molly. Um, is basically you take some burlap and you put it inside of your solar wax melter and you put all of your crap on top of it and it melts all through. And what you've got is these pieces of burlap with all of the scents of the hive in it. So it's got wax and propolis and everything else in there. And then we just take that when you pry it out of here, you got to get it out of here while it's still hot because as soon as it cools, it's cemented onto the bottom of that pan. Um, but you pull it off while it's still hot. So you burn your fingers and then you let it cool. And it makes a nice stiff mat and you drape that inside of the hive right on top of all the frames. It does, you know, it adds a lot of scent. And if you spray this with Swarm Commander, that wax and everything else absorbs it really, really well. But it also, you know, um, does a good job of slowing down the airflow and, you know, adding a little bit of insulation in that. You get that a little warm and the scent really comes out on top. It, it's something that I, that I use all the time. So, you know, when I'm harvesting in the fall uh, or late summer and I'm using this, you know, I'm, I'm making all of these and I put them in a plastic bag and keep them. And so in the springtime, I have all of these sheets of burlap that are covered with wax and propolis and God knows whatever else. Works very well. And then uh, this is uh, something called a Russian scion. We've never quite figured out why it's named that. Um, but George put this together last year. Um, basically, you take an old frame with one of those uh, split rails on the bottom. Um, then you hang your slum gum mat on it. And you put a little shade on top of it. And he's got, you see the two little strings hanging up there. So if you've got a busy bee yard that you're not always necessarily attending, you can hang one of these things up. If your bees swarm, this is going to be the most likely place for them to land. So if you've got you know four or five bee hives in your yard and you're not gonna be paying attention and put this somewhere where you can see it from the kitchen window and this is most likely where your bees are gonna land or your neighbor's colony before they go find a permanent home. But this is, a, this is gonna be a good first stop and it works pretty well, right? 
So that covers scent. And now we're going to talk a little bit about accommodation, right? You, you, you got to give them the right amount of space in there, right? So the first and most important thing is to give them some comb to lay in. So if the queen can start laying eggs as soon as she moves in, assuming she's a fertile queen, right? That's going to anchor your swarm really, really well, right? As soon as they start laying eggs, that swarm is going nowhere, right? They're, they're going to stick like glue to that. So I put in yellow comb and old black comb because black comb has the most amount of scent. But a lot of times when I go into that swarm and you look, they are not hanging out on the old black comb. They're hanging out there, but they're not occupying it. They're adopting that yellow comb and they're building new comb. So the black comb is good, but the yellow comb is also good. Um, make sure that they have something to attach onto. The other thing is they wanna give them some open space. You gotta give them some space, man. So they want to congregate. They're looking right when they move in or when they're scouting. Like I said, they're buzzing on the inside. And so they want to hear that echo. So if all you've got is that whole thing filled with frames, they don't get a good sense of the space that's inside of there. So leaving some open frames in there will allow for that echo to happen so they can feel that open space, the place to congregate um, in there. But always put starter strips on everything <laughs> because new swarms, build wax like you can't believe that they build wax so fast you'll be just shocked and amazed um and so you make sure that your box is completely filled with frames and you've got starter strips on all of those frames so that when they start building they're building onto a frame because if you leave some space they're stuck building on the ceiling which is i had that beautiful fish trap it was like a perfect thing except for it was too big and so they built on the ceiling instead of building on the frames. That's the way it goes. So you read a lot about, if you, if you read a bunch of stuff on swarm traps, people talk about you know, using nukes, you know, five frame boxes or smaller ones um, and making them special sizes and all that kind of stuff. Um, some of that is valid, some of it is not. Basically, I mean, the bees will go into anything. But basically, what Tom Seeley in his studies from 30 years ago basically showed that they want about 40 liters. And 40 liters, uh, 42 liters, is roughly about the size of a natural hive in the woods. So if a hollow tree, you cut down a bunch of them and you check the size of them and so forth. And they're about 40 liters. So that's kind of where that came from. Is it bigger? Is it smaller? I don't know. But that's about one 10 frame deep box is, is about 42 liters. So that's kind of the standard of what they'll take a look at. So how big is a swarm? Well, if a swarm, we usually, in suburbia, especially now, we have two deep boxes for our brood chamber. And so we've got about two deep boxes full of bees. 70% of them leave or 50% of them leave. So you'll get about five frames of bees. So if you have a five frame nuke box, you may be quite well overwhelmed, right? You may have more bees than will fit into a nuke box. So small swarm traps, you get small swarms, right? Big swarm boxes, you get bigger ones. So there's lots of different ways to accommodate them. A 10, standard 10 frame box is real easy. If you've got it, use it, great. If you like doing things in medium frames, um, this is something I, um, you know, I like to start off. Some people like running mediums, like LP's probably gonna be running all mediums. A lot of people are just running all mediums um, moving forward. Um, so you can put a medium box and then put a, um, you know, kind of a shim, uh, you know, like a one by four shim on the bottom of these things and made a, a very high tech gate you see right there. Um, and so that moves them into a uh, into medium frames. The swarm troopers there on the left, um, good value for forty dollars. Now they're probably fifty bucks now, um, but they last a long time. They last until you give them away with a swarm accidentally and you never get it back. That's how long they last. Um, so that one lasted five years. Uh, it's probably sticking around somewhere. So this is kind of the way I set it up, right? So the entrance is there on the bottom right. 
going open and closed. Um, you know, usually only a couple of inches. Right next to that, I want open frame. So when bees come in, they buzz and they hear that open space, right? And then off to the back corner in the quiet air is where we have, you know, the black comb and the yellow comb. And that's where I put my scent back up in there. So putting, you know, whatever it is that goes up in there. So when they come in, the, the, that scent is a little bit stronger in the back corner. Also, when they move in, Right. The queen wants to start laying as soon as possible, but she needs the box at 98 degrees. Right. So if you have it nice and quiet back there in the corner, the bees can build up that temperature inside of this hive much more quickly with the frames opposite, you know, furthest away from, you know, the entrance. Um, so that's generally the way I set it up. You can try whatever else you like. Um, to dampen the breeze coming in there. So here's kind of the stack of things, a, a wide variety of stuff in front. So the frames in front um, are fairly new, um, but you see that there's a little bit of a green tint on them. That's because we sprayed them with propolis, but you also see that they're burnt. So we just took brand new frames and we got the torch out and put a little, little torch on them in there. The third frame in has got some string wrapped around it. Um, that's an old frame and I just used the string to hold a starter strip in, which is just a strip of wood in there. Um, there's a couple of uh, dark frames in there that that yellow plastic one is old dark frame. Um, and uh, so the, the two with the D on it are yellow um, drawn comb. So we got plenty of drawn comb in there. And sometimes I'll throw a feeder in there too. So we, um, if, if you, if it's going to be late in the season, um, you, you can uh, put a feeder in there in the, if you, you don't think you're going to get to them. In the springtime, you usually don't need a feeder too much because they've got enough forage going on. But, you know, in the, later in the season, you, you're going to want to put a feeder in there, in there. So nuke boxes work, but <laughs> they may be too small. So this is on top of my Phil, little shed in the backyard. Phil, can you stop from Phil? Yeah. And somebody's asking on the chat on the bottom about uh, wax moth if the frames. Um, I think it's a good idea to mention that normally the frames before you put them outside to be uh, on the um, on the new traps uh, is good to put them in the freezer for three or four days and whatever is there it dies. So. You, they, virtually they're clean. Uh, yeah. Even if they have a wax moth there, it's dead because it's frozen. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Phil. No, that's good. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see, the chat doesn't show up for me. So um, yeah, so if you're, using, if you're using black frames, you know, old black comb, that's the stuff that wax moths really like. Wax moths don't care about yellow comb. It's kind of a misnomer. They really don't like wax. They like all of the old, the, all the other stuff that's inside of the old black comb. And that's what they're eating. Um, so if you, you have a lot of black comb, I recommend, uh, Jerry and I talked about this uh, a couple of years ago, is, is don't put all your black comb together. You know, the black comb is still needed to help the scent in the box, but throw some open frames or some yellow comb in between it. Because, you know, two or three, especially black combs, next to each other that turns into a you know a, 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 a bait hive for wax moths um, and if it's full of wax moths they usually don't move in or they move in and then they leave real quickly because they're like yeah we can't deal with this right so this is a swarm that came into a nuke box and it just didn't fit it's had two days they kept on cramming in there the, the box was just jam-packed and they were still an inch thick on the outside. So I had to get up on the top of the shed and get a normal size box and put them in there. And they were, they were pretty happy. It was, uh, it was seven or eight frames worth of bees that showed up, but they tried to fit in there, right? So you wanna keep the box good and dry. So telescoping lid, right, is good. Uh, insulation on the top. Um, a lot of people are using that, um, um, uh, the, the insulation, um, the bubble wrap stuff these days, that works really good too. It, it steals it, I 
uh, Reflectix. You pick it up at Home Depot. Um, it's silver metalized bubble wrap. It's very good for insulation. So um, I use mostly foam lids, but the Reflectix should be a, a great addition to swarm traps also because it seals everything off and it keeps it nice and warm in top of there in there. Um, sometimes I use a piece of large plywood or chloroplast on the top. It's, you know, that's, that's even bigger and put a brick on it just so it shades it and keeps the heat down and also keeps the water off of it, right? The entrance needs to be only a couple of inches, right? There's lots of ways you can do an entrance. You can get those little entrance discs. Those things are really cool. There's all kinds of, me the metal ones are like two bucks or something. Um, there's plastic ones, the, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but it de definitely needs to be airtight. You want to keep all the breeze out. So if you have screen bottom boards, throw a piece of core plaster, just cardboard on the bottom of it. Cardboard works just fine in a swarm trap, um, right? It's wood. They don't have a problem with it at all. The swarm trooper is lined with cardboard and works just fine. Um, and it also absorbs scent really, really well. So if you throw a little bit of swarm commander on that, it helps out really good. The box temperature is important, right? We don't want to get too hot. So if it's in the middle of a sun, you know, a sunny day and it's way too hot, it's, you know, it's getting over 90 degrees when the bees are visiting, they're going to just say that this place is too hot and they're not going to be able to, they're going to assume that they can't control the heat. So, um, so you, want to, you want to keep it somewhat cool and insulate the roof. That's why, you know, a layer of Reflectix or Coroplast, um, that, that's a corrugated plastic. That works really good for taking a lot of solar load off of it really quickly, right? Um, and you want to keep it level. They build comb at a crazy rate. So if you're not level, they're going to build according to gravity and you can end up with a lot of wonky comb really, really quick in there. So then the last thing is location. Location, location, location. Where the bees are, my swarm waits for me. And uh, I got a friend, Mia, and she's got a beautiful little garden and she's got all kinds of bees visiting and all the time. And uh, I got a slide showing it, the box I put in her yard every year. Put it in the corner of the yard, looks nice. She loves it. Every once in a while she gets a swarm. I usually get about two per year out of Mia's yard. We only got one there last year, so maybe this year we'll get some more. But it's always busy, and we don't know who in the neighborhood has got bees, but somebody does, and uh, they're creating traffic, and they're cruising down. The other way I do it is uh, my backyard is where I keep all my bee boxes, and that's where I rinse out stuff, so the ground smells like bees. The, their boxes are all around, and there's bees showing. How they, were, they were out there, you know, visiting all of my stacked equipment just yesterday. I'm like, you know, or a Sunday when it was nice and warm. I'm like, there's bees floating around here. They're scouting already, right? Um, if you know where a bee tree is or a bee shed, um, I know that um, Tom Kaczynski, Tom and Jackie in Fremont, they had a shed that had a swarm underneath it and it would shoot off swarms every year. And that was before they were beekeepers. And then they decided to become beekeepers. And they put up a swarm trap and those bees would leave out from underneath the shed and they would end up in their boxes. And then they went away and they found out they were in a neighbor's shed. <laughs> so if you know where some bee trees are or some sheds, um, oh, we worked, um, Greg was working with a guy in Milpitas and we walked around the property a little bit and sure enough, we found some bee trees. So we set up swarm traps and we were very lucky up there also. So if you know where bee trees are or some wild swarms sitting around, then by all means, uh, set them up there. Uh, so this is the, uh, the little stand in, in the corner of Mia's garden. Um, and uh, that's, that's a keyboard stand, found it on at a garage sale, you know, to, for a musician to play keyboards on. Works really good as a temporary stand. Um, does just fine. In this one, you see that there's a group of bees hanging off the bottom. So when the bees all show up, the queen lands inside of that swarm. And sometimes she just lands on the bottom of the box and, and there's not, she does, does, doesn't get the clue. They start moving in, but after a day or two, there's still a clump down in there, right? The queen does never moves. So sometimes you have to kind of help them out, right? 
So I would open up the top of this box, get a frame out and slowly drag it across there. So I end up with a frame covered with bees and drop that into the box. And then after a couple of times, there was a queen in there somewhere and then they all went inside. So if you ever find them clumping, clumping on the bottom, that's probably what's happening, right? I put the entrance downwind just because it seems to make more sense to me that, that you know, it's gonna keep the, it's gonna be less windy inside the hive and it's gonna let that scent travel a little bit further for them to find it in there. The height, there's lots of stuff on the internet all over the place. You can put it wherever you want to, but to Alfie's point, don't put a box where you're not gonna be able to get it back down again, <laughs> right? Some people hang them from trees, that'd be great. Make sure it's on a pulley and you got a rope tied off somewhere that you can lower it down easily, all right? I've got a little shed, it's all of six feet high, right? And so I'm all of two steps up on a ladder to be able to pull that thing down and I've got a method to do that. So um, I got a friend who has a second story deck um, and that was a very good swarm trap for many years. She never used the deck. Well, she does now, so we don't have the swarm trap there anymore. But it worked really well. Um, it was nice and high. You know, they had a nice vantage point. Um, so on the frames, older is better. Put starter strips on everything. Got to have starter strips, right? Um, black comb, you know, you need a couple of them, you know, but not too many of them. Um, some partially built out wax on yellow ones. Um, if you get some of the, you know, cause I, when I give away a swarm, all I ask for is frames back. And so sometimes I get built frames and I get the all plastic, the plastic, plastic frames that are built out. And once they start getting, you know, kind of old and janky, it's like, what do you do with those things? Well, they're really good for swarm traps. You get out a jigsaw or a handsaw and you cut the center out, just cut the whole center out. So um, I got a little, uh, this, this is for pruning trees, but you can get a drywall saw, same thing. It cuts that stuff just fine. So this one on the far left, you see that's a plastic, plastic frame. And so if you look closely, you see that there, the perimeter is dark and the center is light. That's because I cut the whole center of that thing out one year and put it in a swarm trap, just like the one that's next to it and put that in a swarm trap. They built that whole thing out crazy fast. Um, so I'd given this away to somebody and they, they said, there's this really weird frame. It's dark on the outside. <laughs> what happened there? It's like, oh yeah, that was just one of those frames. I just cut the center of it out. So if you're wondering what to do with some of these old janky frames that you've got, you know, cut them up. Or if you, you, know, you just got some old black comb, cut it in three strips and now you've got three starter strips, right? A little bit of dark comb, good scent. They'll build off of that thing and, and straighten it up. No, no problem, right? Um, but you definitely need to put starter strips in it, right? Glue them in, staple them in, you know, tie them on with string. Um, cotton string is usually recommended because they'll pick it apart and they'll pitch it out the door. Um, but this is a lot of different ways that I do, you know, empty or open frames. Um, and it's just scavenging whatever you got. Old frames is be usually best. Anything that's you've used last year, um, especially if you went foundationless, and you put it in your spinner and you blew out all of the wax <laughs> and all you got is like wax around the rim. Perfect. That's a great frame to toss inside of your swarm trap for next year, right? So my basic formula, an old 10 frame box, you know, once again, you can modify this however you like. Um, some old black comb, one at least, two is good, three is about as much as I wanna put into it because then you just start, you know, attracting the wax moths. There's not a lot of wax moths going on this time of year. They, they, they kind of ramp up when it gets warmer in the summer. Um, partially built out frames, at least some yellow comb in there so that the queen can start, you know, laying immediately. Um, frames with starter strips always. Um, some people put screws in there to hold it in there. Reflectix. Um, now that a lot of people are using this, that works really good because that has some compression that will hold your frames in place. So if you're lifting this thing up over your head to put on top of the shed or something else like that, the frames may shift. And I've had that problem is I didn't realize that. And all the frames fell and they were all crooked inside of the box. And then the, the swarm moved in, swarm didn't care. They moved in just fine. You open it up and there's just a mess inside. 
trying to straighten that one out was, yeah, it took a couple of months, right? And just figure out how you're gonna close that box up if you're gonna move it, right? And later in the season, put a feeder in there. Um, that, that works well also. Don't fill up the feeder yet because then you just attract a bunch of other things. But if you have a feeder in there and a swarm moves in there, you can just slide the cover off, fill it up, and they'll be super happy, right? So if you have a 10 frame box or an eight frame box, make sure you have eight or 10 frames in that box. Um, you know, don't just put a couple in there because they will build on the roof. They, they, always, they always do. They will bypass that frame of perfectly drawn comb and start building on the roof. <laughs> I can't tell you why, right? Um, secure your frame so they don't shift. Uh, fix your bottom board so that the whole thing can be moved re relatively easy. A lot of times I just put a strap around the whole thing. So when I put it up, I put the strap on it. So I'm not, you know, bothering the bees when I, when I, when it comes time to move them. Um, right. I can just close the entrance and pick them up and carry them away one evening. Right. Um, but straps work really well. I, I, I really like that. And just, you know, more traps is always better. I usually put about 10 around town. So there's a couple of places. So I've gotten swarms from people. And so I call them, you know, send them out a text. In the springtime says, hey, can I put a swarm trap at your house again? And they're like, yeah, sure. You know, I did an extraction out of a lady's house and for the past four years, I've been putting a swarm trap next to her house. It's been very successful there, right? So what do you do with a swarm once you get it? This sign was out in Joshua Tree. Never figured out what it, somebody was keeping bees out in Joshua Tree. If you ever figure out this one, if you're going through Joshua Tree, find that sign again um, in there. So this is, this is the quandary. This is where, it, you know, kind of um, um, moving on to the, you know, where I started thinking about different things. Um, so all of the flying bees go with the swarm, right? It's according to Seeley, right? 77% of the bees take off. Right, um, so you got a whole bunch of it. So obviously there's a huge regime change going on inside of the old hive because they now have absolutely no foragers. So that's your first hint that your hive is swarmed is there's almost no traffic. You open it up and it's full of bees. It's because there's all the flying bees have left, right? So in that swarm, all of those bees that left, some of them were just barely able to fly right? They're just learning to fly. And so some of those will leave and those just revert back to house bees again um, in there. And this is your basic casts of the colony. Um, and so it's neatly divided into about 21 days each, right? For their brood for 21 days, obviously none of those girls are going anywhere, right? They're the hive bees. And so it's only some of those last ones that are, you know, guarding and ventilating um, and, you know, they're learning to fly. So, um, you know, some of that middle cast is, and then basically almost all your field bees go with. Some of the field bees are still out in the field when the colony swarms and they come back to an empty hive <laughs> or next year empty hive. So, um, some of them just, just miss the whole show. Um, so you always get some of those back there, but basically, right. You're getting that big chunk of the colony, right? Everything that moves out. Right. So now if you look at that, that is what your new swarm is. If your swarm moves in, that's the population that you have. And so the fact that any swarm makes it at all is still shocking because they have you know, basically two casts, it's not a balanced population. The two casts are completely missing of that. And everybody's just going to be aging out. And so if the queen starts laying immediately, as soon as they're going to have even some house bees, is 21 days from now. And as soon as they're going to have any foragers again, it's going to be 42 days later, right? And you start thinking about that, it's like, all your field bees should be just about dead by the time you have any new foragers again. So there's a mystery going on here as to how swarms even make it. I have no idea. However, I know that because we are beekeepers, we play a little bit of God 
Um, and so what we should be doing is go find a frame of capped brood and put in in that as soon as you have them settled. So steal a frame of capped brood from one of your other hives and put it in there. And lo and behold, that you will fill up all of that cast system very easily, very quickly. And it'll be a balanced hive very quickly. And you're just gonna kickstart that thing really, really well, right? You're gonna have new foragers and house bees and all the rest of that stuff. And so you'll end up with a very strong colony growing very, very quickly. Um, so this, that's definitely my strong recommendation is add a frame of capped brood as soon as you can. In late season, definitely add a feeder, right? If it's, if it's after the, um, uh, the summer solstice, I would add a feeder because there's just not much, there's not much going on in there, um, in there. So after they move in, right, let them, uh, you know, get a, assimilated a little bit. So once this is another picture of that swarm that just hung out on the bottom of that box for three, four days um, before I coaxed them in. So the queen is probably in the middle of that somewhere. Docile yeah, isles can be. Phil, what I used, I took a frying pan from the kitchen and I put it down there and I scooped them all in the frying pan, opened the top, dropped them in, and they were there. Beautiful. And they're you have all to happy. be innovative, you know. <laughs> and how did your eggs taste in the morning? Uh, honey, honey eggs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so we've seen a lot of requeening. So chances of a swarm requeening is very high. First swarms of the year are going to be, you know, your old queens. Um, then, you know, after a month or so, you may be getting virgin queens um, or a couple of weeks later. So if they are old queens from last year, right, expect that they're going to go for superseding in July or August. And we saw a lot of that last year. Um, Sue and I went in through a lot of hives last year and just about everything superseded in August. It was crazy. Everything went, you know, we, we, had, we had cells in there and they were queenless. And we're like, well, they figured it out. Um, and we had some that run rather late into the season. It's it amazing. Um, if you put in a couple of swarm traps near each other, uh, don't be surprised. Um, this one, they couldn't figure out which box to go into. And so they were hitting on both of them. And so half the hive went into one and the other one went into the other one. And, but one of them, the queen went into, and that's the one they all moved into later on. So after a couple of days, they all sorted out. But it's not uncommon to have, if you have some swarm traps up, is to have two or three colonies scouting at the same time. So if you get a swarm, put another swarm trap up right next to it because you may have another swarm coming right after it, especially if you've noticed a little bit of fighting on the landing board um, between the, the scouting troops. So you never know, you know, in the height of the season, they come in hot and heavy. And I have caught on this magic shed, I have caught two swarms in a week, several times in there. So some of the things I don't recommend, I don't recommend climbing on ladders anymore because um, trying to carry a, a 40 pound box down full of live bees, um, they put on weight so incredibly fast, it's not even funny. It, it'll, be, it'll be pretty heavy. Public spaces, you know, good luck with that. Your, your equipment may get stolen, smashed, destroyed, whatever. Um, you know, it's always best to put it in someone's yard or, you know, someplace that you can, at least hide them, um, right? Um, I don't recommend leaving a hive too long before the, um, moving them because they build up at an incredible rate. Um, so I caught a swarm and I and, you know, called somebody and said, hey, I got this swarm for you. And they're like, oh, I'm on vacation. I'm like, okay, well, I'll still be there. They're not going anywhere. And then by the time they got back from vacation and something else and blah, 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 it was 80 pounds worth of bees. Um, and honey and everything else it's not easy to move um, those fiber flower pots that you see sometimes um, sold as swarm traps i cannot recommend those bees will move into them 
but getting the bees out of them is very difficult because you have to cut them all out and then wire them into frames and all the rest of it just makes it best. Just start with something that you can get frames in. So if you want to be creative, just at least start with frames <laughs> and then go from there, right? Because um, the bees will move into most anything, right? Um, so here's my plug for the swarm list. If you're not on the swarm list, first you have to become a member. So if you haven't paid your 10 bucks, time to pay your 10 bucks. PayPal is your friend. Um, we updated it last year so that you can uh, join online. It's easy, easy and cheap as can be. And then you can uh, click on there that you wanna be on the swarm list and you will be on the swarm list and you can get to see all of those things come by. We had over 700 calls last year. Oh, I think it was over 800. I forgot to update this, my apologies. Um, However, if you uh, are home during the day and have the inclination, we do need operators to help out. So it does take a, a host of uh, people um, to help out on that. All you need is a phone and the willingness to answer the calls every once in a while. We dial it into your phone so your phone rings along with all the other ones. So, um, but we also need teachers and mentors on how to chase swarm. So if that's something that uh, you have the inclination for um, chasing swarms and want to teach people to do that. We're always looking for more people to help with that. And of course, be very, very nice to everyone you meet. And of course, be safe uh, this year. And it's not entirely science, um, it's fishing. We have found bees show up in the strangest of places. Um, Sung Lee gave us, uh, you know, the, the, the spare tire um, at an auto shop that was full of bees. And of course the irrigation um, box, um, the beautiful art of the comb on bricks. That's, I mean, those are normal sized bricks. So that whole comb, that's where a swarm landed and they were building it, they were dying. They, they were not gonna make it obviously, but it was beautiful. Um, you know, that's all of what, six, eight inches across. Um, they built some nice comb. And then of course there's Jerry's plastic dinosaur, um, which they have, it's, it's, that's roto molded. So it's hollow inside. So they moved in and they lived in that thing for, for many years flying in and out of his mouth, breathing, fire breathing ants. It was pretty cool. So in summary, all right, it's your social responsibility for use your powers for good and put on your cape and act like whatever, but that's fostering local bees, survivor stack, stock, you know, they're adapted to your neighborhood. Um, so um, they're, you know, as far as um, natural selection, this is the first step is fostering those that are there, All right? And that's what the whole local bee initiative is about, is to try and foster and the local genetics to try and keep them going, right? It's free bees, right? If you've got a dead out from last year, right? You've got enough frames in there to make three or four, maybe five good swarm traps, right? It's, that's got all the good stuff in there, right? But you wanna start getting that stuff together. So about a month, it's, yeah, it's what, five weeks, six weeks, we're gonna be getting our first swarm traps, uh, swarm calls. So, Get your stuff out there because the bees, like I said, they're already scouting. If you've got some old boxes sitting out there, go check them out tomorrow in the sunny days. It's going to be 63 on Saturday, right? They're going to, they're going to be out there. They're going to be fishing. So they're going to be checking it out. Oop. That's not where I wanted to be. Uh, Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, trying to get to my last slide properly here. There we go. So there's the, the three things you can do whatever you like, but you still got to play at least by these three rules that you have a good scent to bring them in. Lemongrass oil is your cheapest option. Um, swarm commander is, you know, the lemongrass is going to be about four or five bucks. The swarm commander is going to set you back 20, 25 bucks, but it works really well. And the rest of the stuff is just stuff you already have for the most part. Accommodation, you can do whatever you want and it kind of boxes, old, whatever. Um, I take my crappiest old boxes and I just seal them up with duct tape. 
um, if they got too many holes in them, right? And the location is wherever you want. You'll see a lot of stuff online for really high and really low, but you know, anywhere, anywhere that's good. If you have a spot where you want bees, that's a good place to put your swarm trap. That way you don't have to move them at all. They move in right exactly where you want them and there they are. So if you, you know, put up your hive stand, put your swarm traps on it, hope for the best. Maybe someday you'll just be tending them right there. So I'll open it up for questions. Anybody got anything? Uh, yeah, Phil, Jim, if you have some hives, uh, like say a couple of hives in an, in an ideal place, would you put your swarm traps nearby? Relatively. So when they launch out, they usually bivouac onto something um, and hang out there. And so a lot of beekeepers will find that it's you know just across the yard, 10, 15 feet away. Um, at my friend Ann's house, they like the bottle brush bush. Who knows why? She's got all kinds of lovely trees and so forth, but they always end up in that bottle brush year after year. There can't be any scent left on that thing, but they go in the same place and that thing's just, it's, it's next near impossible to get them out of there. <laughs> it's a pain in the butt. But that's where they go every year. Um, and that's all of 15 feet away from her hives. So uh -huh. I, you know, um, Jerry and Tom Kosinski, they had the shed and um, they would launch out of there and they would end up in the lemon tree about 15 feet, 15, 20 feet away every year, same spot. Here's so they just put I the swarm trap up in the lemon tree. Yeah, I had, I had one, um, <clears throat> a, a hive, swarmed uh, into a trap that was maybe straight line six feet from the front entrance of the hive that swarmed and they literally poured out of the front of the hive and beelined into the swarm trap like eight feet away six to eight feet away a little, little bit above um, and it, there's no but yeah i mean just just put them all over the place um I, I, it was it was bizarre to watch them literally come pouring out of one hive and go into another one one afternoon. And I, I was like, okay, that's that's way too easy. Uh, um, I like a little challenge um, with swarm catching, and that was like no challenge at all. So I, it's, there's no rhyme or reason, um, but they that's what they do. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Um, I, I, one of the things that I found for me that worked, Phil, this year, I, I was calling it maximum stank. And I was doing things like milking wax and doing things in the backyard. And anytime you're doing like activity like that, um, cleaning frames or processing honey or leaving wet frames, anything to, to create scent. And literally, I would do these things. And like within a couple of days, whammo, I was getting um, another torrent of swarms. And so I even tried spraying um, honey water around the yard, just a little bit of a couple of tablespoons of honey in a quart bottle, sprayed it all around the yard and it just seems to attract. And um, that kind of what I was into, I, I, it was like, it was way too much fun. Um, but yeah, just stink up, stink up your backyard. Um, don't be afraid, stink it up with wax, propolis, old, anything that's bee related, if you can find it, if you're a new beekeeper, and you're wanting, you know, um, just beg for some old, old funky combs from people if you don't have any handy. Um, slum gum is a, is a precious resource. Um, I, I have tons of it. I keep it in the freezer to keep the uh, wax moths away from it. But um, you can make slum gum burgers, make like little burger patties out of it. You melt it down and you sh shove one of those in into a box and, and it, just, it just brings them. It's crazy. It's like spitting on a lure. <laughs> For those of you who don't uh, under, know the term slum gum, slum gum is um, old black comb. Uh, if you try and melt it out, you're going to get almost no wax out of it at all because it's just going to get absorbed into all of the older the old cocoons and the propolis and all the rest of that stuff. So it's that all that all that black comb that you scrape off and you heat it up and it just turns into a gummy mess. Um, and it's a it's a strange thing all by itself. I had a bunch of it in a bucket and after a while there was a black tar coming off of the bottom of it. Yeah. So. 
it's like it's like old it's like pupil carnage or something i don't know it's hard to it's just believings be leavings or something it is seem to work but yeah um the, the stink and but the other thing that you mentioned the other thing that was phenomenal that moment when you're seeing scouts and i've had scouts as early as february 1st uh i mean serious scouts um and like you're saying phil um you're seeing them today too they're looking around um but there's this moment when that that quiet moment happens and it's and it's a very sudden thing that happens so if you if you are anticipating what's going to happen next you'll see this you'll see a cloud of scouts at the front entrance and then literally within a few with a minute or two it goes absolutely silent and within minutes or not even um get yourself ready because i've, I've you it, they've made a decision at that point and they're either going to come to you or they're picking another spot but it's literally a very short time um just a couple of minutes um and you know, bees fly at what thirty miles an hour. So if they're if they're in a tree like a half mile away, they're going to get back to that tree in a jiffy, and they're going to make that decision in a jiffy, and they're going to be come back within a couple of minutes. Um, it's a very fast turnaround. So once that once that swarm trap goes quiet, the turnaround when when you you're either going to get a swarm or or they've already made a decision to go someplace else. But it's it's like just a couple of minutes. It really is that fast. That's the thrill. Oh, it's 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 it is a fantastic thrill. I, I you never get tired of it. No, um, lawn lawn chairs, um, ice cream. Um, let me, you know have you know have yourself set up so that you can enjoy it. Um, nothing like it. Well, um, the one of the um, the advice is that, uh, of course, you know some people have already been doing it a few years. Uh, catching swarms or some people are starting off a new year or this year for the first time. But what I have been doing is the, uh, uh, you know, what are the odds are uh, bees will land the same spot the next year or year after or a couple months later. And chances are pretty high. Yeah. So what I have been doing is that once I catch a swarm, I mark the spot, talk to the property owner that I could set up a uh, swarm trap. And bottle of honey goes a really long way. And who <laughs> would refuse to put it and refuse? So every time they catch a swarm, there comes a bottle of honey, okay? So then what happens is that, um, uh, first it was kind of skeptic. Uh, I mean, who knows, it might not, but the percentage of returning a same spot Somehow, have you noticed that the, bee, the uh, swarms, even though those are totally different bees, I don't know what it is. They sent it out in the email. Hey, if you guys want to uh, swarm, this is a spot. So it, more than likely, it will land the same spot. So then that's where all my swarm traps are placed. And uh, just uh, about past two to three years, just one or two swarms and year after year. And uh, the other one is once you use a swarm, you might want to check around because as you know, the swarm doesn't leave that far. So more than likely there is somebody has a beehive within a block, maybe even a, like a next door or a door down. So then you might want to talk to them or ended up, I ended up talking to a lot of people saying that, hey, you know, here's a bee, if you want it, you can have it. And some people are really embarrassed, they don't want it. Some people love to have them back. So that's a really good connection as well. So, and then at the third year or so, I've seen there's no swarm whatsoever on the same spot. Then more than likely, wherever the source of the swarm haven't died out or dead out. So then that could be a good reason but other than that, so think about it when you catch a swarm, make sure you utilize the same spot for the fewer future years to come. So that way you don't have to really rely on your swarm list anymore. Just depend on those people, whoever they see the, the property owner will see the swarm, they will call you direct. 
and then you are as soon as swarm starts and happening, you get a phone call right there. Then and you're there about a half an hour and one hour. So anyway, that's just the uh, my two cents. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the swarms know exactly where they're going. Um, like George said, um, you know, my swarm trap was getting hit up, and um, and I was noticing it. And but I was at work, and um, my friend down the block, Mr. Chickenoff called me while I was at work and he's like, hey, are you home? I'm like, no, I'm not. He goes, I want my bees back. <laughs> I'm like, what? He goes, I watched them swarm. And he says, I, you know, the, the swarm doesn't move that fast. You can walk along basically and follow it. And um, they left his house, about four, four houses down the block, came across the street, landed on the neighbor's chimney, sat there for an hour or two, and then lifted off and watched them all go straight into my swarm trap. So yeah, he got his bees back, no problem. Um, so yeah, sometimes they know exactly where they're going when they're leaving. You still counted that one? Uh, well, yeah, I caught it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like fishing, sometimes you just throw them back. <laughs> I have in every corner of my backyard, I have one plus another two in the front. Um, and I put them about, uh, six foot high so I can pick them down and I use the what Phil showed on the one of the pictures which is a, a round disc which is an open hole and then with a few holes and then just a breather hole I right. think that's the best one of them all which um, Phil can you show it up again if you can uh, to put on the on your swamp traps because it's very easy to move them. Or you can use the other one, the little with a door. It has an opening on the top and an opening on the bottom. And they go in and out. And then you close the little traps. And then they stay inside. So it's easier to move them from one place to another. Uh, I, I found that very, very useful. Uh, Phil, if you can show that picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find it there. Alfie. Okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't have one upstairs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I send you, a, I send you a couple of videos. Um, uh, I have one on on the um, on top of my uh, grapevine, and now I put struts and I put another three next to it. So uh, I leave them there. And they work every year. I get two, three. I bring it down, put a fresh one, get another one. Yep. Yeah, yeah that, that far box on the, in this picture has got uh, one of those big uh, four-inch steel um, discs on it. Um, yeah. And another thing, if, it's, if it went on a tree and it's too high, uh, if you have one of those extension poles for picking up fruit and things like that, um, take a bucket and tape it with duct tape and spray a little bit of swamp commander inside the bucket and just go upstairs and go bloop. And I tell you, they drop all inside and then you scoop it inside them. You have a box ready and you drop it in the box. I found it so easy. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. Once it was so heavy, I thank God I put them, the box in the right spot. So as I went down, it dropped in the box and it worked. It worked and, great. Uh, Phil is a very good teacher for everybody and he's close to you there. Uh, if you need any help, uh, COVID stops me from moving around, but I can help also. Phil knows how to find me. I do. I just put out the bat signal. Um, <laughs> So, so Kevin asked um, if we could uh, uh, share the link to the presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks to uh, Jeannie and the uh, and the committee, um, the, this this presentation uh, has been recorded, and all of your comments. Thank you for being polite, um, and so you can look at yourself later. And um, yeah, we'll also put this in there. Um, I think my presentation was in there from last year. Um, if we go into some of the uh, other stuff, so. So Phil, uh, when you're making uh, foundationless frames, uh, you would, for instance, take a, uh, an old frame that you pop the plastic foundation out of, 
and then uh, put in like a half inch by eighth inch strip in the top. And then the bees are clued in by the strip in the top uh, where to draw comb. Or uh, you would put in like a piece of strip of wax foundation. Yep. Or perhaps even cut a, uh, an old found or cut a new foundation into strips and use that. Yeah. And it, and just about anything works as a good starter strip. So as long as you get a nice fine edge up there. Um, so. Yeah, I've used anything from a fresh piece of wood. Um, you know, if you, if you got the, the the wax foundation, that works really well because all you have to do to glue it in is a little bit of hot wax or or even a couple of pins. Um, you know, if you buy wax foundation, um, but that old plastic foundation, um, if you you know if it's still stuck in there, you're just cutting that short. They'll build right off of that also. So they just need the clue as to where to build. I use the um, stir sticks from Home Depot. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I glued those in. Yep. Put some wax on there and they, they took to them. So also when I was reading Wally Shaw's book, um, he said that when he uh, does splits or collects swarms, I think he says he feeds them until they draw out uh, like a box full or two boxes full of comb. Wow. That's an angle C and he's dealing with black bees. And that's something I guess we can ask him next week. Pretty generous. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, they, they build comb like crazy. So yeah, if, if you feed them, they may, that may be even faster because you know, every, everybody wants more fresh comb. So that, that's a good point. I, I mean, I was always thinking on the survival part, but definitely for building new comb, mm -hmm. more feed is usually better. They're in the mode. Yeah, I think he said he would even uh, get a colony started and be feeding them and steal uh, frames from them after they had drawn them out and moved them into other things. <laughs> Frame or a yes. building factory. Yeah, I mean, yeah that makes sense. Um, usually uh, when I catch a swarm, I usually start feeding right away. Or uh, given a, like a fresh uh, drawn combs, in there and usually I see uh, they start laying, she's still laying as fast as a three to four days, as late as a one week. Mm -hmm. As the faster they start laying, the, the faster they build up. So uh, the feeding really makes sense. And the, the, uh, systematically, as soon as they catch the swarm, they get, <laughs> they, uh, they get fed. So it, it helps. Oh. So I don't know what it is that, about the swarming that triggers that wax production. I've never heard anybody explain it, but they build wax at just a crazy rate when they move in. And you know, if you look back on you know on the on the cast and when where those girls are, you know, it's th that would be drawing wax. There shouldn't be that many of them in a swarm. So there's. There's something going on there that triggers some different behaviors. They revert back to house bees and a lot of those old roles mm -hmm. um, as soon as they swarm. There's something magic in there that I haven't heard explained yet. I've, I've seen it where catching us, putting a swarm into like into a bank, banker's box, cardboard lid, bringing it home, opening it up the next morning, like have not having had time to dump it into a into a, a you know regular box and they've already started building comb. Yep. You know, on, on the lid of a banker's box, you know, like an inch or two even. You know, it's really remarkable how fast they start going. Yeah. So as, as Paul mentioned in the chat, yeah, it's it's because they feed so heavily before they leave. And and that is true. Oh, honey. It, yeah. Oh, they just they gorge themselves with honey. And that's one of the reasons they're so docile is that there's they're too full to bend over to sting you. Um, <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they're, they're very docile and then that, uh, uh, overfeeding will definitely get them to build some wax quickly. Well, Bill, you know, I want like, to compliment uh, you on your, uh, uh, reiterate your idea about once you catch a swarm, yeah, uh, you put a, a frame of capped brew in. What I find is that when that happens, it's not like you drop an orphanage into this swarm and they just adopt it and, and it keeps them. It, 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 I've never had a 
uh, a swarm leave me once I've dropped in a, a, a frame of a cap brew. It's a great well, system. You're speaking of a docile, um, about about a year ago, so um, the uh, on my Facebook page, uh, somebody uh, posted this lady from uh, Texas B in uh, Texas, um, Erica Thompson, and she's really famous in a TikTok and a uh, fa Facebook. And uh, they uh, tagged me on my Facebook page saying, "Hey, watch this this lady. This girl is doing it with the bare hand, the scooping bees off a bare hand." How come you guys you're wearing a whole gear and then uh, so it really uh, sparked the uh, challenge. And then speaking of a dorsal, of course, when they swarm, they are really dorsal. So then I studied scooping bees with a bare hand. And now whenever I see them, I can't help it. I gotta put my hand in there, scoop them <laughs> up. But they are <laughs> they are tightly knitted and it's really hard to separate them. So have to put the hand in, really a squeeze into in the middle. Even then, I was hoping they get out like every time, like a, you know, hundreds of bees on my hand. But no, just maybe ended up like a 50, 40, 50 bees. And I haven't gotten any stung yet. But again, they are very, very docile. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to put it up more of that. But it, it, gets, it's, it's, it has become very addictive. I have to tell you that. So every time I see that, I just urge to put my hand in there so I can help it. So, but they are docile, they are. It's nice and warm, nice and warm in there too? Oh yes, nice and warm. Yes, very cozy. You wanna take your clothes off and just move right in. <laughs> <laughs> your relationship little... with your bees is getting a little farther than most of us wanna talk about here on the YouTube, buddy. Yeah, that's a video of that. <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, you may be revealing a little bit too much of yourself there, son. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, you know me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Did you have something, Greg? Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, <clears throat> some uh, technical stuff on on storms when they move in because. Normally, uh, well, a couple, a couple items is uh, if you haven't set up a trap before and maybe you're a new beekeeper and you want to do that, getting that black comb is a little difficult. So what I did last year was <clears throat> I ran out and I pilfered a bunch of old frames from Jim Garcia and uh, brought them down to my, uh, my house and people picked them up from my front porch. So I could do that again this year if people are interested in trying to get a a frame of black comb uh, and then you just replace it with a frame of uh, a, a fresh frame of foundation and um, that's it costs you nothing except for that and then the other thing i was going to say is um i i have i baited in a swarm from a bee tree this year or last year yeah it was last year right can't be this year yet <clears throat> but um and I left it in that box probably longer than I should. And when you set up a swarm trap, typically you set all your frames with comb on one side, and then you have your empty frames with your starter strip on the other side. And so there's a, if you don't, you, you got to get in there after a, not too long, because even with those starter strips, there's a good chance of those, those comb getting really uh, wanky or wonky and getting all tied together. So you do have to manage them when they come in because they're building comb fairly quickly. So, because um, I, I did leave one too long and I ended up having like three or four frames welded together. And it was a real uh, pain to have to deal with after that. So anyway, that's all I had to say. All right, last, last question for the evening as well. I've got uh, one. I have one, Phil. Run at the genie's bedtime. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that's right. We have to pay attention to that. Um, <laughs> you suggested at um, toward the end of your talk, once you've got the swarm, um, let it hang out for a week or so in its uh, 
place where you captured it and then move it when you want to move it. Um, I know lots of times when I've chased swarms, I bring them back to the house. I, you know, put them in the, uh, the uh, box that I want them to live in and they're there and they wake up in the morning and that's their new home. Um, I use one box for swarm catching. Maybe this is my problem. I haven't been real successful at that box. Uh, but then I've always wanted to transfer uh, the bees from that box to a more permanent box. But I've always wanted to do it right away because uh, if I leave them in the swarm trap for a week, then when I transfer them to the new location, I've got to go through the whole hoo-ha about you know, um, moving them a mile or uh, putting a whole bunch of rubbish in front of the um, hive so that they come out and reorient and everything. And it's just kind of a pain in the butt. What kind of, have, have you had any experience with uh, transferring them from the swarm trap to their permanent trap, their permanent hive right away and moving them to their new location and, you know, letting them wake up in the morning and, and uh, live in their new place? Or have you, have you always just let them hang out for a week in the swarm trap before moving them? No, you, you, can, you can move them directly. Um, and as you say, right, that, that, you know, they're, they just moved. And so they're in a new reality anyway. They, they paid attention to where they went. And now they're, and they're going to wake up in the morning and figure out where they are. They're going to so, reorient anyway. You know, right. Wherever they are. So, yes. Yeah, so, so if you close them up on that night and, um, and haul them off to somewhere else, um, so even if it's across the yard, you're usually pretty good. So um, if it's if it's in the same box, then it's really good. But if you start opening up the box and rearranging frames, they may feel um, threatened or, or, or not comfortable and may abscond. So we have seen some, you know, I, I had a couple last year. They moved in and they moved right back out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, perfect house, perfect spot. What more can you want? They all moved in and then the, two days later they were gone. Uh, in grates. What's that? In grates. In yeah. grates. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it, that happens. So, I like giving them a frame of brood too, because the frame of brood seems to hold them in that location more. Oh yeah, yeah that's that's a really good idea. Once, once they have that brood, that's their new home, and they'll they'll defend it and and hang around and are much less likely to leave. Yep. When they when they abscond, they don't get their deposit back. That's that's one of the rules I set up. It's like <laughs> forfeit. You forfeit the deposit. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks all for uh, coming. We had another uh, wonderful meeting. Um, if you know another club that uh, would benefit from this, or if we want to do this live, let me know. i will be glad to do it. I've done it for most of the other clubs in the Bay Area, and um, and we're going to try and do it somewhat live on February fifth down in Fremont, and with a whole bunch of props and so forth, without the audio visual stuff. So it'll be a slightly different presentation. So. A great evening, well, everybody. So Thank you, Greg. Looking forward thanks, to hearing Phil. about your swarm captures. Post them on the on the beach at. All right. Thank, Thank, you, you, Thank you, Phil. Good night. Well Thank you. Well done. Thank you. I send you some videos, Phil. Ah, uh, something to watch. It's on your phone. Thanks, buddy. Good night, everybody. Good night, thanks everyone. All. Thanks again.